assign the 45 boat, and uh, that commenced my Vietnam time. Um, while I was there, I eventually became the executive officer, operations officer of Coastal Division 14. And while I was there, we had the bombing halt. Uh, and I was told, as everyone else, to do things differently, come up with some new ideas for some different operations. And I came up with what, what I call the skimmer ops. We get three people in a skimmer or a skiff, small boat, put them in a red hot area that we had correlated intelligence on either NBA or BC activity. And the purpose was to draw fire. And uh, we double loaded tracer and all the guns. And um, when I first briefed this, the uh, division on this plan, uh, I was the executive officer at the time, and I had this kind of groan. You know, we we would go on patrol and come in, and I would debrief the uh, boat officers every afternoon. I believe it was like 1600. And um, that's when they would share intelligence from their patrols, and we would give them the latest, and then they'd go back out the next day. And um, I told them about this idea of getting three people in a small boat, two officers and one enlisted. And I wanted officers because it's easier to hold an officer responsible, uh, for example, for shooting a clan digger um, as opposed to an enlisted person. I just thought that was not fair. And by the way, some of the enlisted folks were, you know, actually better than our officers. So don't, I don't mean to make that implication. So I had two officers and an enlisted person who ran the motor. The officers were, were armed. And uh, when I briefed the division, it was kind of a groan about what, you know. So I then told them, look, I'll be on everyone. I'll be the guy forward with the M60. So I'll need one volunteer to handle an M60 and we'd scope it every night before we'd go out. We'd, we'd uh, scope the uh, M60 with Starlight. Or I'd use an M14, whatever it if it was not a good night. And uh, as Swift would tow the, the uh, skiff out to the area, we'd get in the boat and go up into the river or whatever, and the Swift would be standing off 10, 15 minutes away, shotgun. On a good night, we'd have a fac in the air, and uh, they, on occasion, would have uh, an opportunity to preempt anything that was up. They weren't urgent to come in to assist. And uh, so we were performing those kinds of operations. We also uh, sent some of our boat officers and crews ashore to set up ambushes. Um, uh, those were not quite successful, um, although we did have one incident where some of our people were ashore with some swift boats standing by, and it was along the reef area. and. Uh, they decided to disembark after first light and were out on the reef. And uh, all of a sudden the water gushed up and one of the officers thought it was someone uh, with them waiting on the Swiss to pick them up. As it turned out it wasn't, it was a big group of VC. Uh, and uh, they had opened fire on our guys. Thankfully we were very fortunate nobody was hit. And we were able to call in air support, and they had a, a large number of KIAs. Apparently, uh, the assessment was the person shooting at us was a novice because they would have known that, you know, we were going to return fire, and, and there was a large company uh, of, of BC involved further down in an encampment. This person was apparently uh, set up on this high point to. Uh, monitor the area to see if instead of doing that he opened fire and uh, so uh, that that ended successfully. Um, we had one incident where some guys uh, decided to go into a, uh, a contested area uh, on a rubber boat and uh, one of them fell out of the boat and lost his weapon and uh, but we were aggressively trying to do things that we really hadn't done before, and we met with some success on that. Uh, then that was a very long year. It was a long year for all of us. We all have uh, good memories and, and memories that aren't so good. I think anybody will tell you that uh, overcoming fear 
uh, closing a firefight, uh, which I did the night we uh, sunk a trawler. Um, I had scrambled a boat that had come in from Yokosuka that had been in the yards in repair. Um, the weapons weren't fully mounted. We had only one 50 caliber machine gun forward. The radar was not working. Uh, we had a pile of uh, Willie Pete and white phosphorus on the fantail. And uh, my crew, we were supposed to be off for two days and all the boats were out. Uh, and I, got, I was directed to scramble this boat. So we didn't have enough flak jackets. And, uh, and, uh, but we wound up staying uh, in the area. The, the trawler blew, but uh, we <coughs> traveled at flank uh, at night and more or less remembering the coastline and what it looked like as far as where we were because we had no radar. And um, we closed that firefight just about the time the trawler blew. I think it self-detonated, it went so high. But then we stayed in the area. Uh, this is by Mobiac Mountain, north of Natrang. Uh, we stayed in the area for 20 some odd hours. And Perhaps interestingly, one, I, one of the things I had to do with my boat was to put it between the Vietnamese and the, the uh, South Koreans. Uh, there was a treasure trove of AK-47s floating around in boxes packed with Cosmoline, East German medical supplies, everything started floating to the surface. And uh, the, the Koreans were going to send a group to secure the beach area, the beachfront area at first light. Before first light, I brought my boat in. I was con con uh, communicating with Sector on sideband. My Fox Mike radio was out, so I couldn't communicate with the guys involved in the firefight. They were all talking on Fox Mike. And um, so I got in and I told them I was going to sigh out the area. Before I left uh, the Cameron Bay area, I went out to uh, the island and picked up an interpreter as we were heading as fast as we could to the to the side of the intercept. And I uh, got him to PSYOP, and um, that was kind of interesting. He was a, a young petty officer. They were all good, but this fellow was pretty frightened, and he was actually laying on the deck in the boat with the microphone calling out these stop, come here, surrender, and some other slang things that we were telling him to say, naughty things about Ho Chi Minh and stuff like that. Um, but I then got a, a crackling from my side van to clear the area immediately. And uh, when something like that comes, you don't question it. You, you, and we got out of it. And what happened, the P-52 was coming in the area, was in the area, and had a load left over from its last bombing. And uh, so they directed him to bomb the Mobiac Mountain area, where they knew we had some people waiting to offload this trawler. And uh, that was pretty scary because the, the bombs came in. We just had enough time to, to clear, but the waves from the concussion uh, on the beach were enough to really give us a, you know, a monsoon kind of uh, situation for a short period of time. Uh, then I got with the, the uh, coordinator for the Vietnamese Navy uh, folks that were there, Hudson McGee, it was his name, Lieutenant McGee. And, I was able to communicate with him and told him about the sideband problem and we finally, the Koreans came down on the beach and the first thing they do is, did was they started undressing. And I, what was that? Well, they were UDT kind of guys They were going after that trawler, so they, didn't, they weren't supposed to be doing any of that. But anyway, we coordinated and I was able to pick up a Korean officer uh, on my boat, so I was able to tell him what to tell the folks on the beach, suggested the folks on the beach, and also I was coordinating with the sector and the triangle on Saipan. So that was a, uh, a pretty long night and day.